are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. This is February 19th, 2023, and this is episode 213 of Lighthearted. I'm doing today's opening without a co-host, and I want to get right to today's interview. My guest today is Craig Anderson. I'm sure most listeners are familiar with Craig's website, lighthousefriends.com. It was launched in 2001. It's a, it's an amazing site that serves as a guide to every lighthouse in the United States and most in Canada. Uh, Craig was the recipient of a Modern Day Lightkeeper Award from the National Lighthouse Museum in 2016, and he serves on the board of directors of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Joining me for the interview is Jeff Gales, executive director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. This episode is available in both audio and video versions. If you're listening to the audio version, you might want to go to the USLHS YouTube channel and check out the video, which has some additional material. Uh, in the video version, we actually show Craig's website, and he gives a tour of the features. Jeff and I had a great conversation with Craig, so let's listen to it now. I'm speaking today with Craig Anderson, of course, uh, is the uh, webmaster of LighthouseFriends.com and on the U.S. Lighthouse Society Board of Directors. Thank you so much for being with me today, Craig. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Oh, you're very welcome. And also with us is Jeff Gales, Executive Director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, who will be taking part in this conversation and chiming in, in as he sees fit. Hi, Jeff. How's it going? Good, good. Wouldn't miss it. Good, good. I'm glad you could be here. So, Craig, we're gonna uh, we're doing both an audio and video versions. I should mention both audio and video versions of this podcast episode. And uh, in a while, we're gonna talk about the website and actually look at it a little bit. We're gonna do a, a visual tour of it. Obviously, people just listening to the audio version won't see that, but I want to refer them to uh, the U.S. Uh, Lighthouse Society YouTube channel if they want to see the video version. So. Just want to give people a heads up that we're going to have two different versions of this, but uh, for the most part, it'll be the same. We'll just have that that one section where we look at the website for the video version. So anyway, Craig, a little bit about you first. Uh, you're originally from Utah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, I grew up in the landlocked state of Utah. So it was kind <laughs> of uh, yeah. remarkable that I even got into lighthouses. So uh -huh. My dad, yeah, he's a professor. He was a professor here at Utah State University, which is in Logan, Utah. Okay. And so we grew up not far from the university. And so it was kind of easy and logical to stay here and uh, go to school here. Mm -hmm. So I got a bachelor's and a, a master's degree here. And okay. then after that, left Utah to pursue some more education and moved to California. Mm -hmm. You lived in I, Southern I, California for, for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, I moved to um, Santa Barbara. So I went to UC Santa Barbara, got a mm -hmm. PhD there. And then after gra after graduating from there, I moved to Silicon Valley, the Bay Area for a couple of years. And then eventually decided I wanted to be in uh, wireless telecommunications. And San Diego is kind of the place to be for, you know, the cell phone world. And so I moved to San Diego and was there about 25 years working in wireless telecommunications with various companies. Mm hmm. Now you're back in Utah, right? Living in Utah now, again? <laughs> yeah. So now I'm back in Utah. So yeah. when the pandemic hit, um, we had the option to work remotely. And so I decided to, to come back to Utah for a bit. I was reluctant at first because I thought the pandemic was only going to last, you know, a matter of weeks. So I didn't want to make that 12 hour drive and then have to turn around, you know, a week later and, and move all my computer stuff back down there and resume work. But it ended up being, you know, months and then it eventually turned into years. And uh, there were some, you know, calls to come back to the office at different points, but that got postponed and delayed. And eventually, it was last September when we actually got the mandatory return to, to office announcement that actually actually took place. So mm -hmm. I went back to San Diego at that time and uh, decided that uh, I think I wanted to live in Utah now. So I resigned my job and moved back to Utah. So I have family here. My parents are in the assisted living center. Mm -hmm. and so it was just uh, thought it was a good time to be closer to family and to be closer to them and be able to provide some support for them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned your career a little bit there, but you were uh, have been an electrical engineer by trade. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's the field I worked in. 
Mm -hmm. So okay. developing it was, in particular it was developing modems for for cell phones. So you know the little chip that lets the cell phone communicate with cell towers, all the communication that goes back and forth between the phone and the the cellular network. That's what we worked on. Mm -hmm. It's pretty important. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, how did lighthouses first get on your radar? Did that happen after you moved to California? Yeah, yeah, it actually happened, but it didn't happen in California, which is interesting. So, you know, I was there in Santa Barbara, actually there on the coast. And there is what, you know, you might call a lighthouse there, right? It's mm -hmm. uh, sort yeah. of. <laughs> the original one was destroyed and now there's kind of a, uh, a metal tower there. But I actually, I don't think I ever saw that while I was living there going to school. But I, as I said, I moved to the Bay Area, worked in Silicon Valley for a little bit. And it was while I was working for a company there that I had a work assignment that sent me to um, to the to North Carolina, to like the Raleigh Durham area. There's the research triangle there. So I was sent on a work assignment there, was working there for several weeks um, with the company. And uh, so on the weekends, I had some free time. So I was looking for things to do. And uh, I was talking with uh, the admin there, and she happened to have a postcard in her cubicle of the lighthouses of the Outer Banks. And I mean, it kind of caught my attention. It's like, wow, those look those look amazing. You know, I think that's one of the things I want to put in my agenda to do on the weekends. And so I planned a trip to go out there, and uh, they put me up in like a three bedroom apartment. So I had um, some family actually came out and joined me that weekend, and we drove out to the Outer Banks. And it was there that I saw my first lighthouse. It was Body Island. It wasn't the best day for viewing lighthouses. I remember it was a downpour. But we visited Body Island, went down to um, Cape Hatteras as well, and then climbed up to the Wright Brothers Memorial in a downpour, got soaking wet. And But that was my first exposure. And uh, I guess it kind of resonated with me because later I went into, I was doing some shopping in, uh, in Raleigh in a mall and uh, saw that this artwork um, in a shop and it had uh, these paintings of the five lighthouse towers around along the outer banks and uh, I'm not a big art purchaser and so the fact that I actually purchased a, a painting I think it, you know kind of showed that the lighthouse has actually made some kind of connection and to me so I purchased that and, and still have that painting and, and really enjoy that painting to this day. Mm -hmm. So would you say it was largely the the visual appeal of lighthouses that kind of captivated you at that time, or was there there more uh, in addition to that? Yeah, I think that was the initial pill was just seeing those, you know, the lighthouses, just the structural, just, I thought they were just beautiful, beautiful structures. So mm -hmm. I know some people say that, you know, lighthouses are, you know, America's castles, you know, some of the more historic buildings we have, some of the more visually appealing structures, I would say that we have. I think that was the initial appeal. I mean, I, I was into photography at the time as well. So lighthouses became a, you know, a good subject matter to, for photography. So that was, yeah. that was the initial appeal. Sure. I want to talk more about your photography in a minute, but what made you decide to launch your lighthousefriends.com website? Like what brought that on? Yeah. So after, so I, I returned back to California and uh, started, you know, looking at lighthouses that might be around there. So I recruited some friends and we went on um, a lighthouse trip. So we went up the Northern California coast, visited some lighthouses there, stayed at Point Arena Lighthouse, which Jeff is familiar with. And uh, that was like the first lighthouse trip. And then there was other ones up to Oregon and other places on the West Coast. And I think on one of those trips we were discussing, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I should make a, a website to chronicle these lighthouse visits, provide some information. And so I think we even discussed some names for a possible website and the name, you know, Lighthouse Friends um, came up. So, but I didn't do anything about it. And it wasn't until I think it was 20, 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. one of the friends, Marilyn, she gave me the, the structure, the, 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 the beginnings of a website. She had a brother-in-law that was into computers and into website design. And so he put together the, the beginnings of the website and uh, that was, she gave it to me for my birthday. So I had a <laughs> few example pages and had a database set up and I could just add to it over time as we visited more lighthouses, add pictures, you know, information, directions, stuff like that. So that's how the website had um, its beginnings and it kind of took off from there. Mm -hmm. 
little did you dream it would become yeah. the the most popular uh, lighthouse website on the internet <laughs> is that true i don't know i didn't oh, know i i think <laughs> i don't think there's any doubt about that i, I mean yeah. I, I not that i've done a study but yeah i i know in the early days i had started my new england lighthouses website a few years before that uh -huh. and i was one of the top websites but you blew by me <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> partly because of the scope of your website, you come right, yeah. around and yeah. because there's a lot of useful information about visiting them and everything. So yeah. uh, I'm, you know, no, no uh, professional jealousy or anything there. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I use your website all the time too, like so many people. Um, Do you so, still use that basic uh, template or have you, has it evolved over time? I mean, it's still the same like database, but um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't actually use the same template and stuff. I, I actually do all the the changes directly on 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 the database itself, rather than through like a, an online interface. So that way, it's it's a little more secure for me. I keep the actual master copy uh, local instead of up on the uh, up on the internet where it could be hacked or you know accessed. I had some issues with that at some point. But, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, right. I think I remember that. <laughs> Your yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's actually and actually one of the, the hosting company I had at one point they were they had a ransomware attack and so all of the websites they were hosting um you know these people encrypted you know their whole servers and so the website actually went down for a week or two there but um fortunately I mean I had a backup of the website that had most everything and eventually that provider was able to recover all the information but um I decided to switch hosting companies after that but yeah. Uh, so along with the developing the website, the information on the website and everything, as you, you mentioned, your photography, which is a big part of it, your, a lot of your photos are on, on the site as well. Uh, you have actually photographed every lighthouse in the U.S., right? Is that the continental U.S. plus Alaska, Hawaii and Puerto Rico? And probably not the, all the Pacific territories, or maybe you have. No, 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 I haven't done the Pacific territories. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, the 50 states and uh, and Puerto Rico. I've covered mm -hmm. those. So. How about Canada? You've done, I, I know you've done a lot of Canada. You haven't done all of it, have you? Or have I you? haven't. I haven't done all of Canada. I've done the majority of Canada, but there are some that I'm missing. I mean, yeah, I haven't set the goal to actually visit every lighthouse in Canada. So I'm a little leery about setting some of these goals. I get kind of fixated on them and, you know. <laughs> driven and, it, and it, could, it can be expensive to visit some of these remote lighthouses so i definitely want to see the land-based ones i haven't been to manitoba yet so there's some lighthouses in manitoba in canada i'd like to see those and there's a few in um, western ontario so west of like lake superior on some lakes there i'd like to to visit those as well those are more mm -hmm. accessible yeah and some of the british columbia ones are, are pretty inaccessible have you done most of those yeah yeah, I've done all the lighthouses in British Columbia you have. for one. Yeah, there's one. Except I'm for one. Yeah. What's the one you're missing? Um, it's along the inside passage. So we took a ferry along the inside passage and was able to photograph a lot of lighthouses from there. Mm -hmm. And then also when we got up to, up to, what is it? Ru is it Rupert? Yeah. It's a Rupert the, Island, yeah. Yeah. So from there, we took a, took a plane out and, was able to visit some remote lighthouses up there as well but there was one along there that um that i actually missed so so maybe we'll go back someday but um yeah, yeah. well that's, that's impressive on the west coast yeah that's really impressive i was in british columbia and i got some of the you know the southern part a bunch of them huh? but uh so many of them are hard to hard to get to yeah uh, yeah yeah so i'm impressed by what you've accomplished to, uh and you've been to some other countries as well besides the us and canada right I have. Yeah. I, I haven't taken like a lighthouse dedicated trip outside of the United States and Canada, but um, I have visited, I think, um, I think it's 26 countries I've seen lighthouses in now, but not, not a vast number. So if I'm, if I'm traveling the country, I always try to make it a point to, to see a lighthouse when they're nearby. So it's a vast number to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most no, 26 countries is uh, press impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy traveling. I mean, some of that, I've taken some cruises and so cruises are a, a natural way to see lighthouses. I mean, as you come in and out of ports, you're always going to see some lighthouses if you're, you know, if you're paying attention, if you're looking out for them. Mm -hmm. So some of them have been through I that. don't think uh, I ever told Jeremy this, but I remember the first time Craig and I met, 
uh, we had corresponded uh, and we knew about each other. And yeah. I was on a Lighthouse Society tour in Maine and I was in Portland Head Lighthouse. Uh, I don't remember what day or time it was, but it was, a, you know, during the daytime. And yeah. we had members who we got special permission to climb the lighthouse, which normally is closed to the public. Mm -hmm. And one of our members comes up and says, hey, well, uh, somebody named Craig Anderson is here and he wants to know if he can come say hi and meet you. And I mean, what a coincidence that he was there the exact same time yeah. our tour was there uh, on that day at that instant to yeah. uh, say hi. And of course, I like Craig climb the lighthouse. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that was the first time we ever met, but <laughs> complete coincidence we were in Maine at that lighthouse at exactly the same time. I mean, how does that even happen? Well, <laughs> well, now that you mention it, Craig, do you remember we met at the double light yeah. in York one time? It was the same trip. It was the same trip. Wow. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just happened to be at Noble Light. And I think I think it was when I was doing van tours yeah. and I had you a small doing, group yeah. there. You had a group I think it was in the before. early days of that. So it was probably uh -huh. cl close to 15 years ago. Does that sound about right? Um, more than certainly more yeah. than 10. Yeah, yeah. Around 10 years ago, I think. Yeah. Mm, well, you okay. should have played the lottery that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was an un unexpected pleasure to meet you while I was at, at Noble Light that day. Uh, so how long did it take you approximately to photograph every lighthouse in the U.S.? Yeah, it wasn't my initial goal to do that. I mean, you know, it started out slow, just a couple of trips. And it wasn't until a couple of years into it that I actually thought, oh, I think I want to visit every lighthouse in the United States. So it took it ended up about 10 years after we after I initially started that I actually mm -hmm. saw my last, my last lighthouse in the United States. And it was on a flight in Alaska. So it was actually over Cape Hinchinbrook Lighthouse. That was the final lighthouse uh, that I had to see. So. Well, that is really impressive because it took me like 20 years just to photograph every lighthouse in New England. So never mind the, <laughs> the whole country. Approximately how many different lighthouses are listed on Lighthouse Friends now? Uh, that's, yeah, I, there's, I mean, between the U.S. and Canada, there's around, I'd say around 1,600 lighthouses. So that's, you know, 1,600 times all this information. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. I mean, it took many years to develop. I mean, it started out, you know, kind of, you know, rough with little information there. And then just eventually, you know, I kept thinking of more things to add. I mean, at different points, I thought I was done. Then I thought, oh, you know, let me go back and add, you know, the keepers. At first, I just added all the head keepers. And then I thought, oh, I've got to have them all. So I went back and added all the assistant keepers. And first, I focused just on the active lighthouses, the ones that were still standing. And then I went back and added all the, lo the lost lighthouses. So it's just kind of grown over the years. So I think now it's kind of mature. Um, I try to keep it current, but, um, you know, make sure all the links are still valid and stuff. But um yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. It's, it's yeah, pretty mature at this point. Huh. Well, one of the things I love, in addition, just the, the comprehensiveness of, of it is the, the clarity. As you mentioned, you try to keep it clear and pretty simple to use. And I appreciate that. Yeah. It's not, not every website is, is like that. So uh, it's really easy to find what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to make it very navigable. So, so people don't get, um, you know, confused and have to go back. And so hopefully, yeah, hopefully it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to your, your photography, Craig. Yeah. Uh, again, you said it took about approximately 10 years to photograph every lighthouse in the U.S. And uh, you photograph also most of the lighthouses in Canada. Are there any uh, especially memorable experiences that really stand out in your mind about getting to? And I'm sure there are. I can see you yeah. smiling. <laughs> I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's many actually. Or yeah. There have to be with the number of lighthouses you photograph. But what what comes to mind is some of the most memorable experiences getting to and photographing lighthouses. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. You know, the the draw is is making memories. I mean, it is a good way to create a lot of a lot of memories. Um, some of the more memorable experiences. I mean. I'm going to Alaska immediately comes to, to mind. I mean, probably my least favorite way to visit a lighthouse is by an airplane. I mean, it's nice to get an aerial view. It's a nice perspective. You can get some nice shots, but it's, I really enjoy getting up close, you know, being actually able to touch the lighthouse, um, to, to be there, you know, and to get more of a feel for the area than just, um, than just flying by. So in Alaska, I actually chartered um, some helicopters and took some helicopter flights out and landed at the lighthouses. So like um, Eldred Rock, um, Sentinel Island, 
um, Cape Decision, and Five Fingers Islands. Those are some of the lighthouses visited by helicopter up there. And it, I mean, it was it was enjoyable to go to those remote locations by helicopter. Um, it's not cheap, but it's uh, definitely memorable. And I remember, like when we went to Cape Decision, we had a sign like a waiver that said, you know, you are entering a place that's dangerous. You know, it's the rocks are slippery. There's wolves and black bear in the area. So they made you sign a waiver that you know, <laughs> you know, limited their responsibility for your, your for your visit there. Wow. And at Five Finger Islands. The, the crew that took care of the lighthouse at that point happened to be there during our visit. So it was fun to, to talk to them about their restoration and their restoration plans. And that lighthouse has actually been used for uh, researching whales. A lot of researchers go there and uh, stay there during the summers and, and research whales. And it was fun to climb the tower and to watch the whales. Um, some whales were so close to the island that you could actually hear them you know breathing just offshore. Wow. So that was, a, that was definitely... Since you had to sign that waiver, did you see any wolves or bears or anything like that come out? No, <laughs> no, fortunately not. <laughs> I mean, it would have been, yeah, that would have been really memorable. But uh, so no. if you could get close enough to hear the whales breathing, I mean, were you like feet from the whales? I mean, how close were you? Um, yeah, I mean, probably a couple hundred feet. So they were just, yeah, just off there in the sound. You heard the blowholes blowing. Yeah, you could just hear the blowhole and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was great. So yeah, getting to the lighthouse, I mean, that's part of the experience. I mean, I'm, I'm not an avid diehard hiker, but also, but hiking to the lighthouses has also been great. Um, up in, on Vancouver Island, they have the West Coast Trail that goes around the West Coast of Vancouver Island. And a lot of hikers do a multi-day hike along there. And there are some active staffed lighthouses along the trail. So I hiked into one of those lighthouses. It was like a 13 mile round trip hike that did that trail it's quite an adventure. I mean, they have ladders and, you know, it was, it's always wet up there, so it can be yeah. slippery, you know, you can take some falls and tumbles, but it was fun. We hiked down to Pachina Point Lighthouse, which was still manned, got to meet the keeper there. So that was a great experience um, hiking there. Um, Punta Gorda in California is another great hike and Osable Point in, um, in uh, Michigan. It's great there to see the, the sand dunes around that area. Yeah. Um, on that 13 mile hike, uh, how did the keeper get out there? Um, I mean, the keeper, I mean, he, they reside there, right? So they're, right. they're there full time. Is it, and they drive there, there a road? No. By, no boat, road. Uh, by boat, I would think, or, or helicopter. And then more yeah, recently. Helicopter. Because while we were there, and a helicopter actually landed. So the Coast Guard was performing some maintenance there. So a Coast Guard, a Coast Guard hel helicopter flew in there and landed. And that's how, that's how they access most of those lighthouses now. Can you imagine being stationed out there as, uh, you know, literally the only way to get anywhere is to hike out, you know, yeah. miles. I mean, give me a break. I mean, for the original keepers, that was, that was it. I mean, they were very isolated. Right. And um, I mean, they were also involved in a lot of rescues because there were a lot of shipwrecks off that part of the coast. Yeah. And they were, I mean, a literal lifeline um, for the shipwreck victims. So, mm -hmm. but even yeah. today, not to have any vehicle or anything, just to rely on a helicopter or people bringing you supplies and having yeah. to walk out if you need to, that's, that's, that's pretty brave. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I mean, recently, just in the last year, there was an article about a lighthouse keeper at Cape Scott in British Columbia that had heart issues and they had to send a helicopter in to, to evacuate him and take him to a hospital. And just, just last week, I was corresponding with one of the keepers up in British Columbia he was updating me on a change in personnel at the lighthouse so I could update my website. And I was curious, you know, how they got their internet access. And so I, I just asked him, I didn't, I said, I do you happen to be using Starlink, you know, part of that constellation of satellites that you know, Musk's company has, has launched. And, and they actually were. I thought maybe they'd be using more of an antiquated system that had been there for a year, you know, probably a satellite based. But I was surprised that they are actually using Starlink for their internet access up there. So. Cool. So they're staying, yeah, they're staying connected there. They're, they're high tech. Yeah. 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 Well, I agree with you that the, the ones that are the most memorable and the most fun are the ones that are the hardest to get to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't been to Alaska, but I've been to a few lighthouses by helicopter and those, that's, uh -huh. those are ones that really stand out in my mind. So I understand also that. The, for me, uh, when I'm out touring lighthouses, sometimes when things happen spontaneously that you don't expect, that creates a memorable, memorable event too. Like, you know, yeah. when you Portland Head and see the Lighthouse Society, oh, what timing is everything, you know? Yeah. yeah. Spontaneous is good too. 
One sure. time we were, we were taking a boat tour up in the Apostle Islands. So we chartered a boat and we're visiting all the lighthouses and landing at, I think, all the lighthouses there in the Apostle Islands. And we were almost done for the day. And the captain, he actually, you know, showed us how close he could get to the island because the water was very deep by the island, you know, so he says, oh, watch, you know, we can get really close to shore just because the water is so deep offshore this island, you know. And then later on that day, um, I don't know if he got distracted or what, but he ran aground on a, on a sandbar. So we weren't going that fast, but we were going, you know, relative, you know, at a pretty good clip. And it threw his wife down the stairs at the front of the boat. I mean, she hit her head and started bleeding. Oh wow! And he had a radio, one of his friends, to come out and uh, and rescue us, to pull us off the sandbar. So that was <laughs> that was one of the adventures we had. I would say that's yeah, that's pretty <laughs> memorable. It reminds me of the time I yeah. was uh, I was lecturing on a American cruise lines ship, and we uh -huh. anchored uh, off Nantucket, and they had to use a shuttle boat to get people ashore because uh -huh. they couldn't bring the big ship in very close. And the, the guy uh, running the shuttle went out of the channel. It was low tide and beached us. Uh, we were stuck there for like two hours or something until some wow. uh, guys from an Italian yacht came and rescued us. But one like 95-year-old woman cut her leg getting out of the boat and she was on blood thinners, et cetera, et cetera, had to go yeah. to the hospital. So, yeah, that's pretty memorable. <laughs> I, I read yesterday that uh, as this has nothing to do with lighthouses, but uh, it's a shipwreck story. They had uh, Disneyland had to rescue people. One of the boats of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride started sinking. <laughs> they had to rescue people off the ride. This just happened? Yeah, it just happened recently. Oh, wow. Oh, that's <laughs> that's I'm sure it wasn't funny for the people, people there, but it's. Yeah. I don't know if I would want to actually touch the water. God knows what's in that water. <laughs> yeah, true, but, true, uh, true. I thought it was funny that those boats, one of the boats started sinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to ask a question that's a real wide open question, and you don't have to answer it. I, it's a yeah. question I get answered all asked all the time. But the question is, do you have a favorite or uh, more than one? Uh, do you have any favorite lighthouses, either one or more? And again, I know I always yeah. say it's it's hard. It's like picking a favorite child or grandchild. Exactly. Or yeah. <laughs> I know some people say that you know it's whatever lighthouse they're they're writing about or whatever lighthouse they happen to be researching at the moment. Yeah, because there are a lot of details or there's a lot of history about each lighthouse and it is easy to become, you know, focused and attracted to that particular lighthouse at that moment. But I'd have to say that my, you know, my favorite lighthouse uh, has to be Hasita Head Lighthouse. It was one of the lighthouses I visited early on with um, some of the lighthouse friends. And uh, we were lucky to get one of the rooms in the in the B&B there. They let us put four people into one room. So I actually spent the, the night on the floor that night. And the innkeeper had told us to, um, to take the flashlight that's in each room and to go up at night to visit the tower. And we, you know, they told us, you know, stand with your backs against the tower and then, and then look up. And that was the first time I'd ever seen like a first order Fresnel lens in, in action. And that was amazing. I mean, I, I described it like being like, like the spokes of a wheel, right? You have these, big beams of light that are slowly rotating above your head and those rays of light are racing out to sea and that was one of the more you know memorable experiences is, is seeing the first order Fresnel lens in action and just down the coast from there you have the umqua river lighthouse which has uh you know red and white beams so it has some red panels that go in some in front of some of the the bullseye panels to create the red beams and one night when we were there it was foggy and the fog just accentuated the beams and it was amazing just to stand there and watch the beams circling through the the trees and and the fog and then actually for my 50th birthday i planned in advance and booked they let you book a year out so i booked the the entire uh b and b there to see the head that's in the keeper's duplex so I booked that out and invited any family members that wanted to come along so I had my parents and siblings nieces and nephews and we stayed there um, for my birthday. And uh, one of the nice things about staying there is they have a seven course breakfast in the morning. They serve great food. I mean, like frappe, egg sacita, that's something that we now make on our own um, that, are, that are great. They had crab cakes. So it's just an amazing breakfast, very memorable as well. And uh, I know a lot of uh, lighthouses have ghost stories and I've never had 
a lot of person paranormal experiences. But while we were there at Hasita Head, there's a, a lighthouse story that goes along with Hasita Head. There's a ghost named Rue that's supposed to be a you know a friendly ghost that sometimes plays you know tricks on overnight guests, will move things around, but is known to be friendly. At night there, we were sitting around um, in the living room. So everyone was there. We were kind of in a circle of chairs. And I was reading the history of the lighthouse as I have on my website there. And I got down to the paragraph where it talks about Rue and the ghost. And I was like halfway through that paragraph, paragraph and the door in the next door room like slammed shut. Uh. And there, was, there was nobody, nobody else was there. The, the innkeepers you know, had gone home. We were the only ones there in the in the inn, and there was no wind or anything, no explanation that I can think of of what would have caused that. So it kind of it kind of sent a shiver up my spine, and I know there were some some wide eyes when when that happened. But uh, yeah, that was that was a funny, memorable experience that happened while we were staying there. Yeah. And we also went up to uh, North Head Lighthouse just over the border there on that same trip, and had rented the the two keepers' dwellings there to stay in. So. Just out of curiosity, from the first time you slept on the floor at the Hasita Head <laughs> to the time you had your your uh, eggs Hasita, yeah. and, uh, how had that property changed? Had it gone through a restoration, improved? I mean, it sounds like a pretty amazing experience the second time. Oh, yeah. I mean, even the first time. I mean, the reason we were sleeping on the floor is there's only one room available, mm-hmm. and it just had one bed, and there was four of us, and they kindly just let us, you know, cram four people into that small room but i mean it has improved over the years i mean they do have more offerings you can tour the duplex now they offer tours and they even offer um you don't have to stay there to eat they also offer you know on the weekends you can go there and uh and enjoy meals and stuff so it's a beautiful keeper's house it's just gorgeous and the location at his seat ahead is second to none i mean that view from there is amazing I can, what is it about the light that comes from an actual Fresnel lens that's so moving? I can't explain it. If I could figure that out, I'd make a million dollars, but it's just something about, I can imagine you just sitting back and looking at that view with the light coming out from the top and it was amazing. Yeah, Yeah. it It never gets old taking that hike up there. And there, you know, you have these offshore rocks, the sea stacks that are there. You have the beach, you know, there's like a, there's a bridge there with a stream that comes down into the into the ocean so it's just yeah it's just a great setting hikes to take in the area so yeah yeah i've definitely. been there i didn't get to stay overnight but the the whole oregon coast is pretty pretty special absolutely yeah amazing. Yeah. yeah it is a great spot that uh, craig slept on the floor and his seat ahead that's actually available for you anytime jeremy <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Misty Anderson, the uh, who manages the the, the B and B there. She's been on the uh-huh. podcast, so uh-huh. I do do hope to stay there sometime. I don't know if I want to sleep on the floor, but uh, then let me uh, jump to another subject. You uh, sure. you co wrote a book on New Brunswick lighthouses, right, Craig? Yeah, uh, about uh, ten or eleven years ago with uh, Kellyanne mm-hmm. Lockery, who I know in New Brunswick. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so what what led to that? How did that happen? Yeah, so after I'd finished visiting the lighthouses in the US, I started, you know, expanding into Canada and traveling there and really enjoyed the trips to Canada. And one of the early trips I took was a trip where we flew into Halifax into Nova Scotia and then drove over to Prince Edward Island. And doing so, you pass into a little bit of New Brunswick. But Kellyanne had some information posted online about some of the lesser known lighthouses on Prince Edward Island. And so I contacted her just to get some information about visiting those lighthouses. So that's, that kind of started the initial you know, conversation, the initial correspondence was when I took a trip to, to Prince Edward Island. She also put me in touch with uh, Carol Livingston, yep. who was in charge of the Prince Edward Island Lighthouse Society. And she gave us a personal tour of West Point Lighthouse there. We got to stay in that lighthouse as well. So that was, yeah, that's how I, I met Kellyanne. And then later, you know, a few years later, I went back and visited, you know, more lighthouses in New Brunswick. And uh, by that time, I visited the, the archives in Ottawa and had photographed a lot of their collection of historic lighthouses and uh, to add to my website. And so just talking to Kellyanne, is, we decided, you know, we could combine our resources. She had great contacts with the Coast Guard there in St. John. She'd, photogra- she'd photographed a lot of their um, collection of lighthouse images and uh it had information about the keepers so we kind of pooled our resources and decided to write a book together so mm-hmm. yeah you know. 
Um, well, Rip Irwin about, had done one, right, on Nova Scotia. Rip Irwin has a great book about the biohazards yes. of Nova Scotia. So we wanted to do something similar for New Brunswick. I mean, not a lot of people go to New Brunswick, you know, not as many as go to New Nova Scotia, but um, there, there hadn't been a lighthouse written about the lighthouses of New Brunswick. Mm-hmm. So we decided to, yeah, to cover it. Yeah. And I believe it's out of print, but I think people can track down copies on online if they. Yeah. Can. Yeah. I think you can still. For sure. Yeah. So. And while I was looking for information on you and looking on, on Amazon, I found a listing for something called 500 Lighthouses. Is that a, a book that actually exists or ever did exist or what, how did, what's that all about? No. Yeah. It's amazing that the, that the listing is online, but uh, yeah, the book was never actually published. So I was published, I was contacted by a publisher that was doing these books on like 500 photographs of a particular, you know, subject. So there was a lighthouse, there was a book called um, 500 Cottages mm-hmm. and then a follow on called 500 Bungalows. And the publisher wanted to do one on 500 lighthouses. And so I actually supplied the images. At that point, I was shooting mostly on film. And so I supplied negatives or actual prints. I had some digital as well at that point. So I provide the I provided the 500 images, and then they decided to cancel cancel the project. So I don't know mm-hmm. if it was like poor sales or what. They just decided they didn't want to follow through with it, and so it got canceled. Yeah. But I noticed on Amazon you can actually there's a seller that's offering a, a copy of the book for sale. So I'm kind of tempted to like order it and see what arrives. <laughs> well, I saw the listing for it, but I think you have to order it. Why not? Is it it was yeah. expensive? Yeah, yeah, it's like 12, 15 bucks. So oh, you should do it. <laughs> well, the listing I saw said, I think, not available at this time. So oh, yeah. maybe, maybe they took off the, the, the one list. I saw I had. Yeah, it had a listing of some seller that was offering the book for sale. So, yeah. Well, yeah. just to let you know, uh, Cider Mill Press in Maine is actually doing a 365 Lighthouses book. Oh, okay. 365 photos, and I'm going to have a lot of photos. And actually, I've been kind of in charge of putting the photos together for that. Uh, so that's coming. They did 365 mountains earlier, so very similar to what you're talking about. Like a lighthouse a day, kind of that kind of what it kind is. Kind of, yeah, pretty much, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Okay. So, so watch for that. I think it'll be out All next right. year. Uh, so you also created a couple of lighthouse apps some years ago. Yeah. Uh, are those still in existence, or what's the what's the story on those? Yeah, unfortunately, they're not. I mean. The first app that I created, uh, there was a company called Sutro Media, mm-hmm. and they had this platform where you could, um, it was kind of, you know, you could fill in templates and create an app. So it was an easy way to create an app that without having to do all the underlying programming, which can be pretty, pretty intense. So a lot of companies use this to produce like on, you know, like apps that were um, guidebooks. So it was a popular way to do that to like tour cities or tour national parks. So I was able to use that framework to create, um, you know, an app that had all the lighthouses in the United States. So it worked out pretty good because you can put in the travel instructions, the the history, the images. So it was a it, you couldn't do a lot of customization beyond that, but it 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 worked good as an app. But then unfortunately, the people behind Sutro Media um, decided to discontinue supporting it for some reason. Not sure exactly why. And uh, so after time, you know, the software became outdated because you have to keep up to date with the programming interfaces and stuff. And so after, you know, a couple of years, the apps will cease to work and won't be supported anymore and just removed. So that that happened to that. And then after that, a coworker of mine who was a great programmer, he and I collaborated and uh, made an app for Android. So we made a U.S. Lights app and also a Canadian Lights app. So that was good because we could actually customize and add the features we wanted. So you could go through and you could like, you know, tick off which lighthouses you'd visited, keep track of how many you'd, you know, you'd visited in each state in total. You could put in like when you visited um, the date, you could add any notes. Um, yeah. And then you could even, I mean, I use the app in my own lighthouse travels as well. I had a feature where um, you could have it read the history of the lighthouse to you in kind of a computerized voice, but it was, it was good. So as you're traveling to the next lighthouse, you could use the app to actually, you know, do the navigation, pull up a turn by turn direction and, and guide you to the lighthouse. And while you were driving, it would read the actual, you know, history of the lighthouse. So you could learn about the lighthouse while you were driving. So it had a lot of nice and nice features. I thought it was a great app. But then unfortunately, the company we were working for was bought out by a company that didn't allow its employees to work on apps. 
<laughs> so they kind of viewed it as, as a, as a non-compete, you know, they didn't want people thinking that their employees had inside information or something, something like that. So they, they didn't allow people to actively work on their own apps hmm. uh, as employees. It so, sounds like it was brilliant, though. What a great, what a great app that must have been. I thought it, I thought it was great, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, we had to stop supporting it, and uh, yeah, so eventually yeah. I had to remove it from the app store. So it's no longer available, but hopefully someday we can bring it back. But yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, maybe the three of us should be talking about something. So <laughs> put that put that aside yeah, for now. But... I mean. People don't like to pay a lot for apps. And yeah. so, you know, it's hard to, to justify spending. It takes a lot of effort to, to maintain the app, keep it current and do the initial work. So, yeah. But yeah. It's, it's a great product. So, yeah. It's a great yeah. Tool. But it is it is a lot of work. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so uh, back to your website, I just I'm just wondering, I, I think I know the answer to this, but you you do all the work on it yourself, right? You don't have somebody uh, who's yeah. uh, working on that site for you. I guess yeah. part two of that question is, is there anybody on the horizon who might be and not they I mean, you're going to be around for a really long time. I, I'm sure <laughs> of that. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, but is that, do you, do you foresee, uh, is there, is there like a, a webmaster and uh, apprentice or anything training, like that? Uh, yeah. Not, not currently. I mean, I, I have thought about that. I mean, but that's actually, um, part of the reason, you know, I agreed to help with the U S lighthouse society and some of the, the work there was mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to see all this effort go to waste. And so some of this information, you know, I have contributed to the to the U.S. Lighthouse Society's research catalog and uh, put it on there. So it, it will be around um, forever and, and, and last. But but hopefully there'll be some transition for the website as well. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting because my thinking has gone uh, through a lot of the same, you know, on the uh -huh. same same lines. I'm trying to share as much of my stuff as I can with the U.S. Lighthouse Society to make sure it. It yeah. lasts as well. So yeah. that's a good, good cause. So uh, how, when did your relationship with USLHS start? And you are also on the board of directors. Uh, how did, and how did that come to be? Um, I mean, shortly after I started visiting lighthouses, I mean, I, I ran across the US Lighthouse Society and I was particularly drawn to their magazine, the, the Keeper's Log. I mean, I found it a great resource for learning about lighthouses and for researching lighthouses. I mean, the articles in there were very um, in-depth and, and well-written. Well so I thought it was a great resource. So I signed up. I mean, it was a bargain for me to sign up for a lifetime membership at that point. And so I signed up for a lifetime membership and have been a member of the society for, you know, over 20 years now. So, so that's how initially I got involved. And uh, how I ended up on the board of directors, I don't know. Jeff would have to, I just got a call, you know, asking if I would, um, from Mike Vogel, asking if I'd like to, to be on the board of directors. And uh, at that point, I had a, a very intensive job and I had to think about it, but um, and I actually had to get permission from my employer to, to be, uh, to serve on a board of directors. And, but they, they granted the permission and I, I gladly accepted um, that offer. So, yeah. I think Craig's came, uh, I brought Craig's name up. Uh, uh, everybody was asked to uh, re think about people who would be appropriate because we needed to build some of, we lost some board members and uh, Craig ended up on the short list. So, and also uh, one of our goals is to try to recruit people to the board who maybe aren't, you know, 80 years old or older. <laughs> you know, no, I'm, I'm being exaggerating of right. course, but yeah. you know, the idea is we want to get, you know, younger people involved uh, who are going to be around a while. So he fit the bill. And of course he's an expert with lighthouses and um and so far so good right craig yeah yeah it's been a great experience <laughs> so uh speaking of your involvement with uslhs and you mentioned the research catalog a few mm -hmm. minutes ago you've been pretty involved in that uh including uh, the integration of your keepers lists your list of lighthouse keepers at all these places the integration of that into the research catalog uh do you want to say a little bit more about that your your work uh, related to the research catalog and what's going on with that yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, Candace, when Candace joined the society as the historian, I think it was back in, was it 2014, sometime around there, or maybe 2016. So if I, if I can interrupt, I'm yeah. sorry, I just want to interrupt for a second for people listening who might not know, Candace Clifford was the historian for the US Lighthouse Society, sadly, passed away uh, 
far yeah. too young a, a couple of years ago, but yeah. uh, one of the most important lighthouse researchers in the country, I would say. Yeah, actually, I, I had contacted her early on when I was researching lighthouses and actually had her, you know, get some information for me back at the National Archives, provide some of that information so I could uh, research lighthouses. And then I actually met her in person back in, I think it was 2014. I was back there photographing their collection of historic lighthouse images and met her there at the National Archives. Unfortunately, well, I guess fortunately, a couple of years later, the archives decided to digitize their entire collection of photographs. So my work was kind of wasted, but, uh, but you never know, you know, when they're going to digitize things. But uh, it was it was a good experience to go back there and get exposure to the archives and just kind of see what's what's there and what's available. But I met her twice back there when I was doing some research. And then, yeah, she became the historian in, in 2016 and reached out to me and wanted to see if I would contribute a list of uh, lighthouse keepers to to be used in the research catalog. So at that point, I had lists of all of the keepers for the existing lighthouses. But I had to go back and get the keepers for the lost lighthouses. And then to that, I added like all of the, the, the people who served on light ships, um, who served aboard tenders, who worked in the district offices, um, who were inspectors on the lighthouse board. You know, anybody who basically worked in the lighthouse service, we tried to, to get their names and add them to, um, to our database of lighthouse personnel that we have there. And now it's grown to um, over 26,000 people we have listed there in the in the lighthouse personnel database. So it's been fun to, to be a part of that. Now I'm trying to collect as many photographs as of lighthouse keepers as, as we can find and add those to um, to the catalog as well. We're up to over 2300 um, pictures of lighthouse keepers, lighthouse personnel at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've invited anybody who has, you know, any any photographs of lighthouse keepers to to contribute them to the website, and we'd be happy to to post them online. So yeah, lighthouse yeah. Keepers, uh, it's a it was a huge hole in history. You know, nobody was doing it, and so it's so great that that's something that you're concentrating on because it's so important to recognize these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think it's great because I mean, some websites like yours, Jeremy, mine has you know, for each lighthouse, you can look at a list of the keepers, but it's hard on those websites to actually look at a keeper and find out at all the lighthouses they served. But on the catalog, in the research catalog, you can actually search by name and it will list all of the lighthouses now where that keeper served. So you can go through their high, their entire career. Yep. And it was kind of interesting that we kind of like, you know, pulled that information together. Um, it, it's hard to know how to combine names because there, there's a lot of people with common names. I mean, how do you know which ones to combine and which ones don't you combine? And so there were some hiccups, you know, in combining the data, you know, you ended up with multiple people being merged into one record and we've had to do some unwinding, untangling of that information. But I think we've got the keepers pretty much pretty stable now at this point, but then we added in the, the light ship personnel and the tender personnel and that's muddied things a little bit, but we're, we're starting to get that cleared up as well. But it, yeah, I think it's a great, uh, a great resource for anybody who's researching lighthouse personnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like putting a giant puzzle together with uh, yeah. not necessarily all the pieces available. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a real challenge, but it's very you valuable. Know, you, you said you, you know your initial goal wasn't to you know document all the lighthouses in America, and you did it. And then your goal wasn't necessarily to get all of them in Canada, but you're getting close. And yeah. boy, but trying to document all the keepers through the years—that's even more of a mo yeah. mountain to climb. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there's plenty to keep me busy. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but so it's work. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, Craig. Uh, and uh, this is uh, I'm just going to throw this out there and see what your reaction is. But um, you've uh, been doing a lot on the research catalog for the USLHS. I know you're also involved in in the on the website committee, looking at uh, ways of improving the website and things like that. Uh, anything else you're you very are very personally involved in with the USLHS or any ideas and maybe uh, maybe there's something you want to uh, maybe you haven't talked to Jeff about this before maybe there's something <laughs> you have in your mind you want to bring up now but uh, anything uh, you know what direction would you like to see uh, your involvement go in and directions the USLHS could go in that maybe it hasn't so much I don't know, I don't know if that question makes sense but yeah you know yeah, I, I mean, I think I think the the U.S. Lighthouse Society is 
is doing a great job of, you know, becoming, you know, like a storehouse for lighthouse information. I mean, I think that that's one of our goals is to be, you know, a place where people where you know, organizations that are supporting individual lighthouses, a place where they can come to, to do research on their lighthouse, on their keepers, and also find, you know, resources to help them preserve lighthouses. So I think, you know, the society has a lot of great resources now online and in, you know, in its board of directors, a lot of experience there that people can tap into. And they also, you know, we also have grants that are, I've been working on the grant committee as well. So we have lighthouse grants that are offered each year. So that's also a great tool. Hopefully we can, you know, grow the fund even more in the future and offer, you know, more grants, more substantial grants that can help uh, individual lighthouses and contribute, you know, more to their preservation. So I think it'd be great if we can, you know, attract more members, more younger members, you know, get them to join the society and contribute and uh, help us with this effort to be, you know, a store a storehouse of knowledge, but also uh, a great contributor to um, preserving lighthouses. And one, you know, we've come up with some initiatives that we're focusing on uh, as a board of directors. And one initiative that, um, that I suggested was um, trying to digitize um, the official personnel folders for the lighthouse keepers. Those are located at the, the National Archives in St. Louis. And uh, last month I took a trip back there and spent a week um, digitizing some folders for, for lighthouse keepers. Uh, just to see, you know, how it's going to work, uh, you know, what what information you have to provide in order to get these folders, you know, extracted from their from their yeah, from their storehouse there. And so it was it was a yeah, it was a learning experience, but it was it was interesting to 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 digitize those documents and find some few, few you know, hidden gems in there about about the keepers. I mean, each keeper had a sign like, you know, an oath of office, you know, when they were appointed a keeper. So you see their actual, you learn about them that way. You see their signatures on the paper. You learn about some of their background, some of the questions they had to answer as well on their applications. So it, I think it's a great resource um, that has information on the service of the keepers. So we were, we're looking for volunteers as well that might live in that area, if they'd be willing to go there and help, you know, digitize some of the records that we've identified that um, that can be that can be done there. So I think it'd be a great resource to um, to add to our our keeper our keeper database. So, and when you went, you just basically saw the tip of the iceberg, right? Yeah, yeah. And then realized, yeah, how big of a task it's 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 going to be. But I think it's a I think it's a, a very worthwhile um, endeavor. So yeah, I'm looking oh, yeah. to get back from yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I didn't know about that. That's what a great service that would be to get get more of that digitized. I, over the years, I've put in requests, you know, for some of the personnel records for for some keepers. Uh -huh. and I know that sometimes you might get two pieces of paper. Sometimes you might get a hundred exactly. hundred documents or something. You never yeah. know. But for yeah. some, for, for a lot of them, there's a lot in there, and uh, mm -hmm. it is it's very interesting stuff. So, and yeah, I'm sure. Them, sorry, yeah. I was going to say that I'm sure you do too. I get emails all the time from people saying my grandfather, my great grandfather, whatever was a keeper. How do I find more about them? How do we get some records? And I always refer them, refer them to the, the personnel records yeah. uh, site, but to have that online would be just amazing. Yeah, just out of curiosity, how did the personnel records end up in St. Louis? Yeah, I think they just, yeah, I, I think they've distributed, you know, different, different components have been placed to different areas around the country. But the, the, the actual personnel folders for, you know, civilian employees, the military personnel, they ended up being in, in St. Louis and have been there for, for several years. Mm -hmm. So this, yeah, they, this facility that they have now is a newer facility, it replaced an older one, but it's, uh, it's a great facility. And the personnel there that are helping um, with the researchers, they, they were very excited to learn that we were coming to, you know, digitize the keepers. They thought it was a great project and were excited to have people coming in there that, they hadn't seen a lot of people, um, you know, doing the keepers. I think it's great that we're putting them online so people can can access them as well. So excellent. Yeah, yeah. and some of those folders, I mean, yeah, some some might have just like two pages in them, but I found out that some of the Coast Guard folders have over four hundred, between four hundred and five hundred pages. So if you're trying to um, to digitize every paper, one folder can take you know a long time, and a lot of the paper. 
they're on, you know, like kind of onion skin paper. So it's very delicate. So you got to be careful. And then they're like put together in these binders, you know, like those college binders that had those metal, you know, connectors that you'd put the, the, the holes through, you know, that have those metal connectors that come up. So it, you have to be very careful when you take out the sheets and then you, to get them back in is also uh, a big effort. You've got to be careful with the documents because they're very fragile. So your keeper research goes from, well, the beginning of the lighthouse service and does it go through Coast Guard uh, uh, time station lighthouses or did it stop at 1939? I mean, are you trying to go through not only lighthouse service keepers, but also Coast Guard keepers at lighthouse? Yeah, we're including, we're including Coast Guard keepers as well. Wow. That so, even yeah. more complicated. That's the hard yeah. part. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, that gets harder. I mean, up, up through, you know, 1912, it's pretty easy to, to get a comprehensive list of lighthouse keepers. But after 1912, it is hard to get... Uh, an accurate list of, of keepers and where they served. So actually these, these personnel folders are a good way to get them. And because keepers moved around a lot. And so there's a record when they move and it shows who they replaced. So you get, you know, information on other keepers when you start um, getting these folders. And I actually found keepers that I'd never heard of before when I was back there. So it's a way to identify new keepers as well. A few. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Craig, we could talk for hours <laughs> easily, easily, but for now I have, and maybe we'll do this again sometime. I hope we will, but sure. I have a, a final question for you for now. And uh, Jeff might have a follow-up question. I don't know, but the, the question is, and this is for bonus points, of course. Okay. Uh, the question is what has been your favorite thing or things There can be more than one about your work over the years, researching and photographing and writing about lighthouses for lighthousefriends.com. I like to travel. I like to to stay curious and to, you know, discover new things. So I think that has been very, very appealing is to is to have, you know, a reason to travel and see the country. Like in the lower 48 states, there's there's lighthouses at like the four corners of the lower 48 states. So if you visited lighthouses, I mean you're gonna travel at least, you know, the perimeter of the country and you're gonna see a lot of interesting places that I I never would have seen if I hadn't been um, visiting lighthouses. So it's just been a great way to explore the country and to create a lot of um, memories with um, friends and with uh, family members as well. So that's been great, that's been very rewarding. But I would have to say like probably the most, uh, my favorite thing is um, just all the people I've been able to meet. In the travels, you know, the people I've traveled with, and uh, some of the memorable experiences was, uh, you know, like up in Canada, actually meeting actual lighthouse keepers. Um, they all turned out to be, you know, very hospitable and very welcoming. Um, one in particular, I met Alice Woods. She was kind of in charge of all the lighthouse keepers at that point. But Alice and Steve, they were at Chatham Point Lighthouse to meet them and then to go to some of the other stations that are still staffed there and meet the lighthouse keepers that was that was a great experience to meet people i know that the role of a lighthouse keeper has uh, has changed and we no longer have you know them in the united states and the role up there is definitely different but they do still provide uh, a service and it was it was great to meet these people who are carrying on carrying on that legacy of being a lighthouse keeper and uh, watching out for people and also meeting people um some of the owners of lighthouses people who are looking after lighthouses here in the States as well. I know, Jeremy, you're familiar with Rob and Lucky Clark up yep. uh, who owned the lighthouses in Vermont. It was great to meet them and visit their lighthouses. And we've remained, you know, friends since then, just keeping in touch and, uh, you know, meeting other people who are also interested in lighthouses, you know, people from other countries that, you know, are touring around the world, seeing lighthouses. It's great to, to, to have them come and, you know, visit and to keep in touch with them. Serving on the Lighthouse Board, meeting these people who have done and contributed a lot to Lighthouses, that's been that's been great as, as well to be involved in this organization and just to meet meet a lot of uh, wonderful people. So I think mm -hmm. that's been my favorite. I think that's, I, 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 I uh, feel exactly the same way that the, you know, we're, it's like a big Lighthouse family that you get mm -hmm. involved with. And, you know, I've been able to do that through the U.S. Lighthouse Society. You've done it all on your own, yeah. Craig, by traveling so much and to 26 mm -hmm. countries all over the United States and, you know, basically developing your own network of, of family that uh, are all interested in the same thing. And, you know, Lighthouse people are special. I've come to realize that. 
Yeah. Stood in lighthouses. There's something good about you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's yeah. I think that's true, right? Yeah. yeah there's a lot of uh, warm-hearted people in the lighthouse community. So. Yeah. 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 Well, that's a, I concur also. So that's a good note to end on for now. And this discussion will continue, but yeah. Craig Anderson, thank you so much for doing this today. It's a real pleasure getting to know you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, for anybody listening again, I think most of our listeners probably use your site all the time, but if anybody doesn't, they need to, they need to check out lighthousefriends.com and uh you know just uh, spend some time and you know go back to it uh as as uh as they're if they're going to visit a lighthouse it's uh one of the best ways to find out information about where they're going so and if uh, you don't know which lighthouse you want to visit it's a great place to go that's true too that's yeah. very true you look at a region and you can figure out which lighthouses yeah, you want to visit just, just surf the site and you'll be inspired yeah, yeah, take a virtual tour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, thank you so much, Craig, and we'll be talking sure. to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Craig. Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. I hope you enjoyed our talk with Craig Anderson. And if you aren't already familiar with his website, you need to check out lighthousefriends.com. I also want to remind everyone to go to uslhs.org to learn about everything the U.S. Lighthouse Society offers, including tours and preservation grants. I will be leading a society tour on Long Island, New York, May 13th to 20th, and you can read all about it on the website. Again, uh, thanks, many thanks to Craig Anderson and Jeff Gales. I also want to thank all the volunteers and staff of Lighthouses Everywhere and everyone who is working to preserve lighthouses in their history. We are all on the same team. As always, to our regular listeners and our new ones, thank you so much for listening and keep a good light. Let it shine, let it shine.